Hey, I'm Dedrick. <laughs> and I'm Noah. And you're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. I didn't like how formal that was. <laughs> I'm, I'm being Edwin. I'm going to do the whole thing with my hands like this. <laughs> So <laughs> we have a very deadly bite today. Mm-hmm. We are talking about the entire first season of Dead Boy Detectives. We received the screener. We've seen the whole series, first season. Really hoping there's a season two. Yeah, I know. Don't yeah. don't put that out there. <laughs> um, so spoilers definitely ahead. This is not a spoiler free review. So just letting you know now. Go watch it. All eight episodes are out, and then come back and listen to us. Or if you don't care about spoilers, just uh, hi. Yes, but we have done our due diligence in giving you the spoiler alert very early on. Very, very early on. Before we get into everything, make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you're following. Make sure you do those reviews. Discord, Patreon, all those lovely things. Everything is down below. Also, this uh, sweater I'm wearing, which is perfect for this episode, um, you can buy from our merch shop. That is classic a bite of yeah very early on so if you you know if you're a creepy kid creepy kid grew up that way watched you know all those goosebumps everything that's what this means perfect for this show are you afraid of the dark <sighs> yes <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of like a little are you afraid of the darkish don't we can't Wait, get into spoiler. it yet. oh and that's true Wait, says spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so how we're going to do this episode is we are going to talk about its origin in the comics from dc comics slash vertigo um r.a.p and then talk about the show. Mm-hmm. So full spoilers ahead. So to kick off this episode, before we get to the review, I do want to talk about their little tiny mini history. We need the history. Yeah. Neil Gaiman is a very prolific comic book writer as well as a writer. And that's where they came from. So I'm very excited. Anytime Sandman anything is a thing. Yes. Now Netflix, I'm hoping, is going to be creating a Sandman universe. The sand of us. <laughs> and this is their first dipping in their toes. Um, there are some crossovers, so... Be prepared for that. So starting off, they actually appeared in Sandman number 25, created by Neil Gaiman and Matt Wagner. They were in the Seasons of Mist storyline where it just pretty much shows the boys meeting. Mm. It wasn't until the Children's Crusade, a Vertigo crossover event, where they got their official title. They kept popping up in different various Vertigo books, which is now DC Black Label. Mm -hmm. Um, For those of you that go out to the comic shop to read them, it's under Black Label or under Sandman Presents. In 2001, they got their own miniseries, Sandman Presents Dead Boy Detectives by Ed Brubaker. Fantastic writer. Fantastic book. It's also kind of, that one really feels like Sandman. Mm. Um, So fans of Sandman will really appreciate that little miniseries. Following the success of their miniseries, they got a manga-style graphic novel by Jill Thompson in 2005. Their popularity from that then led to 2014 where they got an ongoing series written by toby litt and mark buckingham the series was toned down for audiences in their 12 issue run so you have the ed brubaker which is very mature Mm -hmm. and in the 2014 it was a little toned down it wasn't as successful but it was still fun you think because of it it was toned down yeah oh yeah most recently the dead boy detectives returned into 2022 and 2023 limited series as part of the Sandman Universe Initiative. Hello, that's where we're at. The series was written by Porn Sack Pichette Shot and explored the many mysteries, including um, some romantic development between the boys. So it was a very new development and it carried through to the series. Yeah, it sure <laughs> did. Well, it, you know, it's so fascinating seeing how there really wasn't like a linear line. It kind of like Went and stopped and went and stopped. And like, it felt like they kept just popping up. Welcome to comics. Whoa. Yeah. It happens a lot in comic books, but they've always been there. You know, they, they popped up through a lot of different titles. Um, they most recently got one, so that's good. And now they have their show. So hopefully that means more dead boy detectives. Hopefully that's what I'm hoping for. I agree. All right. So let us officially take a bite of dead boy detectives based on the characters by Neil Gaiman and developed for television by Steve Yaki. Edwin, the brain, and Charles, the brawn, are happy being stuck between the living and the dead, solving cases of tortured souls' earthly mysteries to aid them in moving on. Not wanting to move on themselves, they dodge death when she does her duty for the other saved souls. 
Clairvoyant Crystal joins the gang after being possessed by her ex dem- dem- demon. <laughs> <laughs> He's purloined her precious memories and she must piece her past together. Rounding out the paranormal party is Nico, whose near death experience pulls back the veil to the ghostly plane, offering her the opportunity to lend her emotional intelligence to the cases they take on. The Dead Boy Detective Agency is stuck in the Pacific Northwest, counting cats, solving cases, dodging deadly witches, and dealing with their own internal struggles of both their living and afterlives. Ooh, yeah. I mean, that's it. Done. Review done. <laughs> more. OK, more read. That was the longest synopsis I've written yeah. in a long time. <laughs> and I think I got most of the points. Well, that's what the rest of this episode okay, is for. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so as always, what are your thoughts? My thoughts. General thoughts. General thoughts is that like the thing that just came to mind is that I am in. I am invested. Like. From episode one, I wanted to know everything about them. I think that this does such an amazing job of making you care about these characters. And overall, I just want there to be a season two. Yeah, that's my feelings. Exactly. I, I will say, okay, so not a critique right off the bat. The first episode is the weakest Mm -hmm. of all of them. And that's only because there's exposition. Oh, yeah. It's a little like not clunky, but it's like. Once the full cast is there and they're all settled, it's like, oh, this is believable. And I'm completely invested in everything. It also has a mix of so many things that I personally really love and gravitate towards. So not only Sandman and some of those characters popping up in this, but it feels like if you mixed Doctor Who, Supernatural, and like the best parts of CW. Mm. like teen stuff Mm -hmm. like sabrina and all of that like sabrina season one um not the rest of that but it feels a lot like that and it's literally a case by case by week type thing um with a linear story throughout it so it has a driving force but also you come back wanting to be like what is this case about what does that title mean i loved it right and and one of the great things that they do is that Through these cases, they explore their own inner turmoil, right? So the case of the week is actually showing them something that they need to go through or something about themselves. And I agree that this really does house a lot of the things that I gravitate towards, right? So I gravitate towards paranormal things. I gravitate towards queer characters, strong female characters, um, a great ensemble cast. And I really think that this does a great job of marrying all those things together. Yeah, this they did a really good job of it's like, you know, so the protagonists are teens and there's a lot of teens in this, but it's very mature. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that goes well with a lot of people because I I like that kind of thing where it's like there is a time and place where teens get treated like teens and it's for teens. And I feel like this is can be for broad audiences, but with mature audiences in mind Mm -hmm. because the themes are very heavy in this and like they don't hold back on some of the scary and gore um which i very much appreciated yeah i i agree and they do a really good job of when it comes to the super gory things like right as the axe is going to hit the person it pulls away but you see the horror on the other people's faces surrounding it so uh you know i get kind of squeamish with things like that so if they're doing you know the (gasps) For me, well, then I'm grateful, right? I don't have to miss anything. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I do agree, right? It's this thing, it's a really good balance of taking these, you know, teen characters who can get into like teen situations, but then taking that like Neil Gaiman sense of not being afraid to show the dark side right. of things and bringing them together in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And the, I mean, he created this thing where it's like a meld of, um, kind of like fiction that we know like boarding school and detective teens and he married that with this and i still feel like we get that we don't have so much boarding school in this it started there technically um but we have that like hardy boys feel that nancy drew feel Mm. with a mature supernatural twist on it yes um it's deadly and it's delicious and i love every second of it like we couldn't stop watching it no and i need a season two immediately uh, I, absolutely <laughs> i i was like 
you know, sometimes I go into these things a little blind and I never know how I'm going to feel about them. And even though that first episode, like we're saying, is the weakest of the eight, it it was just weak in comparison right. to the other ones. It wasn't an actually weak episode. They crammed so much into that first episode and really laid the foundation for the entire first season. So it's it's solid in that sense. You need all of that information before going into the rest of it. Yeah. And so it's it's one of those things that like, I don't know, it, it just felt like candy in the sense that I just wanted more. Yeah. You know, it was all salty, sweet, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, yum, 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 That's yum, a yum. weird way to describe yum, 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 the yum. show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about our main cast here a mm-hmm. little bit, specifically Edwin and Charles. Um, I loved them. I think that the way they characterized these characters was not only something familiar, but something updated a little bit, um, but surprising in their character growth, even though they've been ghost boys for decades. Yes. I, uh, one of the interesting things with these two characters is there is a bit of an odd couple thing happening right and so we have edwin who is very old english and proper i mean he passed away in like 1913 uh, and then we have charles on the other hand who's kind of new school punk rock from the 80s but they get along and so but they're always kind of filling each other in on different things and i think we also have an interesting thing here with these two characters where edwin can seem cold But I feel like Edwin is in that sense is being very much himself where we find like Charles is overly friendly, but it's a facade. Right, right. He he is friendly and he is good, but it's that what he deals with in the season is wanting to be good. Mm. So he kind of overcompensates with that sunshiny feeling. Um, But he if he was just himself, he would still give off that same thing. It's the overbearingness of it. That people question and yeah. they're like, mm, why are you always like right. this? What is, what is it that you're overcompensating for? And I think there's also something interesting with these two characters and the fact that they, they open this dead boy detective agency to help others, but they don't want to end up where those other souls have to go. So they actually are constantly risking their lives to help other people because yeah. every time that you know, death comes to collect them, they have to run, they have to hide. And so they're just so giving, but yet at the same time need to step away from that part of everything. Speaking of death, and it's a big part in the series and for the boys and, you know, wanting to continue to do this work and not wanting to find out what their afterlife is. Because so Edwin was put in hell by mistake, by error, but he was put in hell. So he was there for what, 70 years? 70, yeah. Um, so it's awful. So he has like an extra, like, I don't want death to get me. And also Charles wants to be with him and is fine where Mm -hmm. he's at. Death does make an appearance in this played by Kirby from the Sandman, um, Netflix, um, series. Love her. Anytime she's on screen, I still, the sound of her wings. So good. That episode. I, I think that was like the only thing Derek saw from that show. I need him to watch this show, but I did show you. Her episode, The Sound of the Wings. Mm. It's just so good. It is one of my favorite issues in that comic. I think a lot of people like that one, but for good reasons. Um, but she's only in it once. You do see her wings throughout mm-hmm. the series. Um, so I'm hoping that in season two of Sandman, season two of Dead Boy Detectives, we get more Kirby because I mean, perfect every if, time. Yes. If I'm going to the afterlife, I would love Kirby to be the one to welcome me. And I think that. Having Kirby in that first episode really was the Sandman, you know, sprinkle of Sandman in it, right? It's letting you know this is part of the Sandman universe. We needed that. And later on in the um, Hell episode, towards the end of the the first season, we do see um, despair in there as well, or misery um, from the Sandman series as well. So it was good to see some other characters pop up as well to also remind us, like, by the way. Morpheus is around somewhere. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I, I think, you know, when I think about uh, George Rextru and Jaden Reverie playing Edwin and Charles, I think they have a bit of an interesting job here, right? So they're carrying on the lineage of the Sandman universe. But they're also, if you think about these characters, so someone like Edwin has been in this af- 
after life or this in between life, you know, for 70 years in hell and then 30 years as a dead boy detective. So they're both like, well, at least he is over 100 years old. Yeah. Right. So you have to play this character of old. I'm 17, 16, 17, 18, but I'm also over 100 years old. It's very Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Interesting right? connection. But yeah, <laughs> like it makes sense. It's but a 12 year old who's really 112 years yeah, old. Yeah. I didn't expect you to. <laughs> but that, but it, that that is true. And then I think they did a good job with also reminding us that even though they're when they were dead, when they died, when they were mortals, they were young, but they lived for so long. Yes, they're wise in a lot of stuff, but their maturity in some areas, like specifically Edwin and his sexuality and how even to kiss somebody and all of that just never progressed. And then same thing with Charles. He never learned how to kind of even like no matter how somebody's treating you, you don't need to appease that person. Mm. Like, you know, when you get older, you're like, oh, I don't need to like make sure that person has my approval that treats me like shit. Yeah. You know, that's just something that develops as you get older. Um, but throughout the series, it was good to see them deal with that or come to terms with that. Um, that was actually one of my favorite things of this first season was how they dealt with some of that stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting that they've spent the last three decades together, but, didn't talk about it. <laughs> right, exactly. There's still that humanity within them of this is something that's a little too painful, so I'm just going to keep it to myself. Yeah. You know, spending 30 years with someone and not even saying like, I think I might like men, <laughs> you know, like that's intense. Well, he is, he came from a time where it's like, definitely not, you can't be a homosexual. And then also he was dead and in hell. So it's like, he had no time to be like, I like butts, men butts. Men butts. <laughs> <laughs> he had more no, specifically yeah he had no time for that um and it is with the help of our wonderful clairvoyant psychic crystal palace miss crystal palace miss crystal, which is a name is amazing edwin Payne, right on. you know he he suffered a lot of pain for 70 years it's very it's on the nose i was i was even thinking about charles roland right row as in in the water where he almost died and he got... Well, that's not how he died in the comics, but that does did, make sense for the show. Did did he die on land in the comics? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he died like in the attic. And, oh. Yeah. He did, yeah. Anyway, so he didn't die on in water in the comics, but for the show, it makes sense. Yes, they're, they're having fun. <laughs> yeah. Crystal Palace, amazing. Her mystery of having the demonic boyfriend haunt her, where her past is, her memories... Her coming to terms with her powers and growing from that. She was a good addition to this because they needed somebody more modern mm. to call them on their shit. Yeah. And also immortal being able to see them and help them with their cases. And and right off the bat, you know, throwing in this third wheel, in essence, you see how it really mucks things up for Edwin, right? Charles is super excited to welcome her in, maybe has an attraction to her. Edwin right away is like, no, 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 I don't like you. You don't need to be here. We're fine by ourselves. Right. And <laughs> and we and at first you're kind of like, wow, this guy's just being a kind of a prick. But you realize later on why he's being that way. Yeah. Edwin was an interesting character, specifically when other people come into the mix, because he's very like, no, like we're OK. We do things how we do them. As it goes on, you start falling in love with him and you start understanding why when more people come into the mix. I think the more people that are around, the better it is for <laughs> Our dead boys. Definitely. Yeah. Crystal, how did you feel about her as a whole for the her, her arc, I should say? I absolutely loved her. I think that she was incredibly powerful, really smart. I liked how strong-willed she was um, and how she really was able to carve her own path in all of these cases, right? She is willing to be there for them, but also take care of herself. And really, a lot of this is... Her journey is a lot about not prescribing to who you once were and being able to create a new self when you had the opportunity. I mean, even if it was from supernatural reasons, she got a clean slate. And the cool thing about that is even when she got a clean slate, she was a good person. Mm. So it's like you learned how to be a bad person because you were just completely neglected as a child from your parents nature versus nurture right and you had these abilities and you could do whatever you want so what are you going to do be a shitty person and mm -hmm. she was awful yeah Making people walk into traffic Ugh. yeah stealing no well I mean, 
the amount she did, not good, but like, <laughs> you know, everybody goes through that. <laughs> I, and you know what, though? I really wasn't expecting that. It's it's interesting that like I really felt her as this kind, helpful, um, badass character. And to see who that's that's who she once was, I thought was it it really kind of flipped it flipped it for me. Yeah. Um, we have to talk about the fourth wheel technically in this. There is like a kind of fifth wheel, but not until the end. Yeah. But the fourth wheel for this, Nico, Miss Nico, just wants the best for everyone. Immediately when you first see her and all those doodle neon things around her, it's like, yeah, we're going to like her. We're totally intoxicated yeah. from her glowing thing, yeah. which is actually bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I love looking at these four together and, you know, Edwin is the brain, Charles is the brawn, Crystal is the mental, and Nico is the emotional. Yeah, she's like the spirit. Yeah. So they they all come together to really fill each of these roles within the agency. And I think that uh, Nico is just so fun and so quirky, right? And so we need that because Edwin is so heavy. Crystal is dealing with a lot. Charles, the same. So when we have Nico come in, she's in these like monochromatic outfits she has jet black hair that ends up turning into platinum blonde. Which is amazing. You know, she keeps the um, dandelion sprites that almost made her explode as pets. So she's just giving and delightful in all okay. ways. Because you mentioned them, I want to just take a small little tiny segue to these dandelion sprites. Mm -hmm. um, they This show was so funny and like not trying to be funny like mm -hmm. i know they wrote it to be funny in this way but it was so naturally for these actors and these characters and sometimes went further than you would think specifically with these dandelion sprites like the amount of times they cussed how many times they ripped into these people is amazing it was so funny hilarious so their names are liddy and kingham and they're <laughs> and they are played by comics and so you'll all know Liddy, played by Caitlin Riley. She is like a super famous TikToker. Uh, she's on Dropout TV. She's the girl that's going to be okay. Yeah. You know that, yep. <laughs> that girl? And so this unexpected, I mean, they're in these like, I, I can't like what, country gnome outfits with yeah. these dandelion hats? Yeah. Like, and they are just foul mouth bitches. Yeah. They are not sprites in any good sense of the word dandelion no wishes they're here to make your nightmares come yeah. true and it was so unexpected but hilarious i love it anytime that nico because in it, the first couple episodes where nico was there she kind of stayed back a little mm. bit before venturing out with them and they would be like in the jar be like oh are you staying here because nobody likes you <laughs> yeah is it because you smell like trout yeah. or whatever they said salmon yeah, breath salmon. like ridiculous <laughs> it's so funny i loved them and i hope I mean, I think by the end, we, we see her with them somewhere. So I'm hoping we get more of them. And my question is, are they her size or is she their size? That's the big question. Right. But she was holding. That's true. But did it shrink did that with shrink? her? Yeah. <laughs> is she in a snow globe? How small is that igloo? Is she in a snow globe? Uh -huh. <laughs> what is the Aurora Burials? Is it just LED lights? That's a spoiler. We're, not we, a spoiler. We just spoiled the literal last scene of the entire first season. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think we should kind of maybe jump into some of our other really cool side characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into bigger themes, but I feel like we can't not mention some of these characters. Yes. Yeah, so I want to talk about Esther Finch, who is our witch. Okay. She All plays right. a big part in this season. Oh, my. Again, this is unexpected comedy. Mm-hmm. Holy smokes. I don't know. So Jen Lyon plays Esther Finch and she somehow marries an evil witch, Jennifer Coolidge and a valley girl. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. It doesn't make sense, but it's so well done. It's so good. Oh, man. It's like just the gold that was shooting out of her mouth. And within the same sentence, she could be horrifically menacing and also hilarious. Yeah, she it's when she was like saying lines to cut them down or doing great clapbacks and then just having a demonic voice in that same sentence by the end. It's like, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I love the links that she would go. The cool thing about the show is like, there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of ways supernatural stuff works. And once they lay out like, okay, they can travel by mirrors. Like, yes, they can go through things. People at near death experiences can see ghosts. Once that's done, it's whatever happens, happens. Like, we're familiar enough with witches and like what they do to where 
Oh, yeah, of course she turned her crow familiar into a boy to lure the gay boy, dead boy, to her. Like, there, there's course. a lot of gay cat and mouse love triangle things yeah. happening through this, which yeah. I fully support. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but her story was actually, by the end, got... I was engrossed in her story. I wanted to see how this would go and where it was going to go. Um, her making the pact with Lilith, her taking down her husband and the husband lover... It was a very interesting story, and she's been there since the town was founded. It's just really cool. One of my favorite things that they did, and they did it twice in this, is that when they tell backstories, they go to animation. Different types of animation. Different types of animation, which I thought was really clever, and it didn't pull me out of it at all. It just like kind of took us out of this real world and brought us into this animated world to to tell it. And I was like, oh, that was really smartly done. I enjoyed that. Yeah, they did it with her, and they did it with Tragic Mick. Mm -hmm. Um, which is another fantastic character, a walrus man that is now a human and stuck this way. And owns a a magical trinket shop. Yeah, tragic mix. (laughs) He is there for all of their spooky needs. He's delightful. I really loved him. And these are the things that I really love about these types of shows where it's like you have a community of people that these people keep going to for things um, that only know about that side of the world that they're dealing with. It's just a really cool feeling. Like, you know, it's still a secret, but like, you're letting people in, you're seeing how that world works. It's a lot of fun. One of the interesting things about this as a whole was the setting. The fact that they are British, their headquarters are in London, but the almost entire first season takes place in Washington. Yeah. It's Washington great. State. Yeah. That was like so unexpected to me. Yeah. It was, it's bizarre, but I like it because then they didn't kind of do, it made it more, I don't know. How do I put this? Like it made it feel more purposeful with the reasons why they were there. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it was really smart for having the cat king, keeping him there. So it created this long thing of like, okay, he needs to find a way to get out of this town. But while they're doing that, there's still cases happening. It was, it was smart to do it that way. Yeah. And I think it felt like it solidified them as an agency who has to travel to solve cases. You know, not everything's going to happen just here in, you know, foggy London. Yeah. (laughs) They just went to another foggy place. They went to Washington. Can we um, talk about the cat King for like two seconds? Surely. Lucas Gage. Perhaps. (laughs) The cat King. The second that he was on screen, I was like, okay, okay. He's, he's being a little, he's, he's selling sex. He's doing the cat and mouse game. And then seeing him and Edwin, and just Edwin's like repressed slash not coming to terms with his sexuality and just like wanting to lean into it, but doesn't was heartbreaking and also really cool that they showed that even for a dead boy. Yeah. yeah. I think it was so interesting right in that first episode when we see the Cat King really coming on to Edwin and you're kind of expecting Edwin to lean into it, to reciprocate, but he can't. And so as the viewer, you're like, whoa, they're getting right into it. You know, and the Cat King, I think, is expecting him to do the same. But Edwin has these blinders on where he can't even admit that or come to terms with it. He's never kissed before. He doesn't know what to do with these feelings that he has. I mean, but even if you haven't kissed, you know what's going on. (laughs) Yeah. And like, I do like that they added the updated story um, that they uh, that Boy to Texas recently had with the potential romance between the two boys. In the series, it turns out, yes, Edwin does love Charles. And Charles, he's like, we have time to figure this out. I don't know if I love you that way, but we have time. And in the end, it does sound like we're better off as friends. But the cool thing about that and the great thing about their relationship is that Charles doesn't hate him, doesn't think it's gross. Mm -hmm. It's like, thanks. Yeah. I don't feel that way for you, but like, we can keep talking about this. Yes. But we're friends still. Also, we're trying to escape hell in this moment that you're admitting that. Well, so yes, <laughs> there are bigger things happening. But I I think it's I like this a lot because the will they won't they I'm kind of fine with it happening. And I'm also fine with it not happening. I think I'm fine with it more not happening only only for the sense of like, you know, that if these two protagonists started like smooching. That they would find some reason to, to drive a wedge. Up. Yeah. And it's like, I love them so much together and they love each other so much and not even death can bring them apart. Right. I don't want some written way to drive a wedge between. Yeah. Them. And I think that apparently 
Edwin, no matter where he goes, is just going to have people chasing after him Mm -hmm. no matter what. Okay. So he'll be fine. But I, I agree that I would rather it not work out because one of the things that I really love is, so let's say that Edwin, you know what? Let's just say regardless of their sexualities, they are not interested in each other in a relationship way. I love watching a very healthy male, male friendship, which entails things like saying, I love you, Mm -hmm. which entails things like hugging each other and holding each other and going to hell for each other. Exactly. Risking your life for each other. And I, I think that we see, um, you know, female representing relationships of friendship like that. That's so easy. Hugging and holding hands and laying in bed together and talking. And we rarely see that between two male presenting characters. And so I really loved that. I loved seeing that. And, you know, this is like way out of the realm, but it's also a Netflix thing. Um, One of the things I love about Queer Eye so much is that these five queer people are, they hold hands, they hug each other. And so this kind of takes it to another level where, you know, with a friend who maybe won't have the same sexuality as you or identity as you, you could still do that as well. Yeah. And that, that's the beauty of, I, I know Neil Gaiman worked on this series as well, and a writer in some capacity and like producer. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about Neil Gaiman's work. Cause even back when Sandman was being written 30 plus years ago, I mean, it, they had trans characters, they had non-binary characters, they had all of these things. Mm. Um, and I love that. And I think that's why I've always gravitated towards his work because he was never afraid to show those types of relationships or mm-hmm. conversations. Um, and I love that it still shows through with this. And I think it was to the benefit of the series to be inclusive with a lot of different people, races, sexuality, relationships, and all of that, and even different types of people. You know, we got, we got the main four who are very different types, but you know who my favorite is out of all of them? Our butcher babe, Jenny. Yeah. (laughs) I love her. I love her tattoos. I love that she has this bespoke butcher shop randomly there tongue and tail is that what it was yes, called that's what it's called <laughs> it's amazing. Good is that? and i love that part way through this series we actually see crystal wearing a tongue and tail t-shirt oh that's what it okay i yes. didn't realize that was the name of the shop yeah that makes a lot of sense i love it she's got the merch and i i love her as a character because she didn't really ask any questions to help these girls and the thing that i like about her as far as this season goes is we don't know much about her, Mm -hmm. but we know enough about her where I want more. And it does seem like she's going to still be around. She should be around for the second season. Um, But she let these high schoolers and and she's like, as long as you pay the rent, I'm not going to ask questions. But towards the end of it and as it's going, she does care for them. So it makes you think, what did she go through to be in this position? I think that both in Nico and Crystal, she sees a little bit of herself in them. And and we don't know her story yet. We don't know her past, but she's drops little hints, right? So we know that this is a family-owned business. She sort of inherited it. She's been running it, which is a butcher shop where she's just always chopping things up and throwing scraps in the back. Her walking around with that meat cleaver all the time. I love her in that Covered cleaver. in blood. Right. There was one point where like she wasn't even really in the butcher shop. And she was wearing a shirt with like blood on it. And I'm like, I love this. That's such smart detail, right? <laughs> yeah. As far as the costume design yeah. is concerned, that is so good. It's so good. And I think that um, she, we also see, okay, so oh, there's a librarian in it. And at first I was like, yay, a librarian. And then I was like, oh, no, <laughs> no, not good. Not a librarian. <laughs> but <laughs> before the librarian happens. There's a secret admirer of Jenny yeah, yeah. and she wants it to just stay that way because it almost feels like the intimacy of meeting the person face to face would be too much. I think she knows what can come when things get too real mm-hmm. and that's hurt. Yeah. Or murder, whichever one and, happens, you know, slippery, uh, <laughs> butcher floors. I, Woof. should we talk about like what our favorite episode is or like standout episodes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Do you go first. What is like your favorite episode okay. or case? Whichever okay, one you so want to So I'm going to do the case and it's the case of the Devlin house. Mine too. Is it really? Yeah. So I, over the last, I would say eight months have started devouring true crime. <laughs> and this episode felt very true crime. Super true crime. Right. What caused the father to snap to hack his family? <laughs> <laughs> that. I didn't care about. 
like I cared about it, but I was just like, yeah, that's not standard, but it's like, it's a true crime thing, right? Mm. Them in a loop, terrifying, devastating, so well done. It was, it was that familiar true crime feeling, but with this extra supernatural twist on it Yeah, and just made it so sad. That's the thing that was really cool about all of these cases is that even though they can kind of be a little goofy, like the angler fish is like kind of goofy. The lighthouse leapers. But having those lighthouse leapers hear their loved ones in some way is tragic and they just fall to their death. And so in this, it's like they've been going and dying for 30 years over and over in a loop and like having them try to figure it out and then Charles getting put into the loop and it was just such a well done episode and it was episode three. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was sold on the first episode that episode three where I was like, oh, they're going to do some interesting stuff. Yeah, with that, us. that's when it felt incredibly dark. Yeah. Right. And so and that's when I loved it. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> First of all, not to be the guy that's going to be 40 next year, but the <laughs> fact that 30 years ago was like 90 something is like, oh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. You know, whenever I think 30 years ago, I'm like the 70s, uh, but nope. not at all. But this also so in in this episode, things are really ramping up. Right. So we're watching this father axe his family to death. And then, you know, spoiler alert, we see Charles get stuck in the loop himself. So now. Edwin and Crystal, who have not been getting along this entire time, have to figure out what's going on. But then on top of that, they introduce the misery wraith, yeah, which is like this backwards, upside down, crawling flesh mummy. No. Yeah. Feeds off of misery. Oh, my God. I was it, it was it was so much happening. And I loved it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I will say, um, if you haven't watched it and you're listening to this to like figure out if you want to watch it, watch it in a dark room. Um, that's like my main critique with this is that if you watch it during the day and you have like light <laughs> in the room, it is hard to see mm -hmm. what's going on. And that's just the nature of the show. It's a dark show and it, a lot of stuff happens at night. Um, that scene in particular was awesome. Like I love horror and I love these types of things. So adding that on top of like all this character development, all this queerness and all of that, ah, ice in the cake. Yeah. Yeah, I also think another really great episode was episode seven, The Case of the Very Long Stairway. Mm. So this is when we really see the true um, power of their friendship. Um, penultimate episode. The penultimate. Oh, your favorite. Yeah. It's the penultimate. But I loved when they were in hell and to get to, well, to find uh, Charles, excuse me, to find Edwin, Charles has to go through the seven deadly sins. Seven, the different layers of hell. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so he's in gluttony. He's in lust. He, it's avarice. Oh man, that was really freaky. It's really cool. I'm very curious. I'm not sure if they mentioned it. I might've missed it in the Sandman comic during the seasons of the mist and how they get introduced is dream going down to hell to confront Lucifer. It's a, it's a long, big thing. Essentially it leads to Lucifer abdicating and being like, I'm done. I'm closing hell. I let all the spirits and everything go back up. I'm done. Here's the key dream. Goodbye. Cut my wings off. And that's how we got the Lucifer comic and all of that. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's happened in this. It'd be interesting to see if it does happen. But that's kind of why Edwin is up there. That's kind of why Charles is up. like, that's why there's a lot of spirits. And because of that, that's actually how Charles dies. Because in the boarding school, there's a bunch of spirits killing people and it's all the stuff. So to see them actually in hell and like going through all this stuff was cool because I didn't expect it. I didn't expect it to be populated. Mm. <laughs> like when they went down there, I was like, oh, did Lucifer not abdicate yet? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's interesting. Where in the timeline of the Sandiverse is this happening? I've named it the Sandiverse. Yeah, you're going to you, Netflix. Are you ne listening? Get on it. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be like the game and galaxy or something like that. Uh, I, I also thought another interesting detail of this episode, right? So. Um, the reason that uh, Edwin ends up in hell is that these bo other boys in the boarding school sort of they sacrifice him right. to a demon. He gets pulled into hell, but he meets the lead boy who did it in this episode. And there's this really interesting conversation that happens where we learn that this other boy actually had a crush yeah. on Edwin. And it made he me wrote feel their initials in the. The whole margin of his book. Of the book, yeah. And it it really moved me because 
it made me feel like, you know, how many young people fear who they truly are and resort to things that are unhealthy because they're afraid to express it to the world of what others might think. Right. And so to see Edwin see this, who has been sort of trying to figure out who he is and what he feels, it really like opened up his eyes to say, we were the same. Right. He forgave him in a way for that. Right. Yeah. And um, it, it's funny that the demon that was, he en- ended up taking him to hell forgave him before he forgave the person that ultimately killed him. Um, it's sad, but it's something that I think not many people think about. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, that person's bullied because they're gay. It's like, well, is the bullying bullying them because they're also not comfortable because they feel like they can't talk about it or be that way. So they're bullying somebody that they like or see that can be able to express themselves. Um, it's a, it's a important thing. And I think they did it really well. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't paying attention, you know, you might miss the very important part. You know what I mean? Like him seeing his initials on there, I was like, Oh, that's devastating. Yeah. And then on the flip seeing Charles, cause there's almost marry each other in a way. And you know, Charles father is very abusive, beat him and his mother and everything. And no matter how much good he tried to do, it ended up killing him. And just because somebody was from a different place like him and he tried to defend him from his friends ended up killing him. Yeah. And so it's another thing of like, oh, the bullies felt bad for bullying somebody lesser than them. So they bullied their friend. Yeah. It's just, ugh. that's like the, one of the things that draws people to these stories, specifically the dead boys is that, yes, it's like, fun and scary and all that stuff and then when you get to the root of it it's like it's sad and it's kind of tragic and these innocent people going through these things so it has this heaviness to it that i think they handled really well in this show yeah it's it's i i like that it is exploration of humanity through dead boys yeah right it's like only those who have passed on can truly see what humans are struggling with yeah yeah and i think it's a fun way to explore that kind of thing. And it almost makes us able to accept that and listen to it more because it's like, they're already dead. You know, it's not a living person telling us. Yeah. They've been through it. They have regrets. They've seen the other side. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have a um, favorite side character from here? Not the main cast. Um, Main cast, I would say is the five, the five. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I think like of the five, I'm really, I gravitate towards Nico, but of course I will say that I think my favorite, Side character is actually the witch. Can you guess who my favorite is? I'm going to say. Oh my god. Okay. Is it someone that we haven't talked about? Yeah. Is it the night nurse? Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. And it's not because of my love of supernatural. She played Crowley's mother, the most powerful witch in the series. You know, not because of that. Mostly because of that. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Uh, I I I love her so much. Ruth Connell. She was such an interesting character and i love in these like death stories where we f- we have like these different organizations these different offices there's always bureaucracy there is if you neil gaiman good omens same thing yeah they have different levels of management they have all it's just such a fun way to tell this and her department is so interesting the lost and found department lost and found specifically for children trying to place them where they're supposed to go um she went through an interesting arc but i love that in the end She's forced to be with the dead boys and it's going to have an interesting dynamic with Mm -hmm. them. But I think we need it because Edwin has been softened a little bit and he's like coming into his sexuality, be that bisexual or fully homosexual. Um, I think we need it with her, like her quips, her hating them. Um, We'll see if she gets softened a little bit. You know, or maybe she'll just always be stodgy no Which matter what and resent so them fine. for eternity. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I do too. I think that uh, having, they really did grow a lot, these characters in this. And so I'm curious to see them taking what they've learned now into the next season. And I really hope we do get a next season. You know, I know that um, we love a lot of things, but this was like intoxicatingly good. Yeah, and it was something where I feel like you don't need to read the comic. Like you should. I mm-hmm. feel like you should read the comics. There's an omnibus of the Dead Boy Detectives. There's not, they haven't had many comics. So they've collected them in an omnibus. I recommend it if you're going to read it. Um, but I feel like it's something where everybody can understand it 
without having all this prior knowledge, right? Because, you know, we're in the world of like these huge IPs and like Marvel comics, you have to have read the entire history of Marvel to even just get this one Easter egg. With this, it's, it's fun to just have fun with the series and let it teach you the lessons it's trying to. Yes, you can, you can very easily learn the world and the universe just by watching it. And I just feel like it's done really well. The sets are amazing. The costume design is wonderful. The writing is fantastic. I really think it ticks a lot of boxes. Yeah. It's horror hot. It's horror heart with humor. It's hot horror. Is that what? It's hot horror humor. <laughs> human. Yeah. I mean, I do, I do feel like some of the, um, it's hard to tell sometimes with screeners where it's like, is this the finished project? Sometimes if like the CGI or special effects isn't in there, they'll put like a red X, like not finished. Mm. And then sometimes it's like mostly finished. Um, so it's hard to tell, like, is this the final thing? Because there was some of the special effects were like, that's a little like, that's a, that's a little shoddy. It mm. didn't take me out because the writing was so good. All these actors were believable. Um, but like fully polished, like if they were to like improve just that slight bit, it'd be a knockout. And I think that's very nitpicky. Exactly. Right. So if you're we're reviewers, we right, have to a hundred percent. But I think that if you're there as just general audience member watching it, you won't be pulled out of it. You might not even notice those things. Right. It's just a really strong first season. Yeah. And you kind of fall in love with all these characters and you don't want any of them to leave. No. So that's the fear is that as you keep going on, like as we were in the last episode and, you know, in the middle of the last episode, things are kind of like, getting a little bow on it and you're kind of like but no there has to be something something is going to leave us hanging off the cliff and then we got like a children of men opening with the shop just exploding didn't expect that i was no. like at first i was like yes they have to stay together and then i was like no that's bad very 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 bad <laughs> yeah not good at all um so the ending of this season one i think sets up a season two perfectly where season one stuff is done wrapped it up like a bow, but leaves us wanting more. And we want to see what happens next, specifically Nico dying, which is super sad. And I don't know what's going to happen. I believe she is a new character mm. for the show. So like, I have no idea who she's supposed to be or what she's going to do. Um, having her die was really sad. At first we were like, Oh, is she going to be a zombie? Cause she mentioned that to they the nurse. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we see her in that igloo with the dandelion sprites. And, and so she was given a, like a small polar bear or a small bear token. And so they're in Alaska. It's making me think of Is maybe she in Alaska. They were in the snow, right? And when oh. you think, when you think of a bear, you think of, I, w I didn't know if they, they said, Alaska. oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but I felt like Alaska because right. The, the constellation of the bear and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And so. Um, you know, why, why is she there? It's obviously the magic of the token, but why are the dandelion sprites with her? And so I'm a little worried that she might not be good. We'll see. They maybe, didn't show her face. Yeah. But maybe the dandelion sprites grew fond of her because out of everybody, even though they were throwing insults at her, she still was like, I'm going to keep them. I'm not going to kill them. Like they're, maybe they can become good. That is the thing about Nico is that she saw the best in everybody. Mm. You know, the line that Mick said to her, you never know when the good is going to come back to you. And that's all she was doing. Mm -hmm. So I have a hope that she's going to be good. But if she becomes kind of like a villain to then come back as Nico, that might be fun. Yeah, it's interesting because the thing that made me laugh is that they're so used to death that this companion of theirs who they grew to love died. And they're like, so let's expand the office. <laughs> The agency is booming. Yeah. So we're going to go to London, right? Yeah. Let's just hop through this mirror. Yeah. They I'm did. Like, they did grieve her a little bit, but. Four seconds. Yeah. I mean, with Jenny being like, they're going to send her body back to Japan. I was like, oh, yeah, that's sad. And then they're like, are you coming to London or yeah. why? I'm like, wait, <laughs> Nico's dead. Yeah. What are we doing? Can we not like talk about other things? Right. Okay, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I am interested to see what happens with Nico in the yeah. next season. Me too. Um, so final thoughts, final rating, final, like, I mean, I think it's pretty apparent. We want another season. We loved every second of it. It was very easy to watch. Um, gory, scary, so many different types of like supernatural horrors. You have kids killing kids that like also abused other kids. And then like 
ghosts and loops and leapers from things and Lilith. Uh, uh, the the washerwoman. Yeah. Who is constantly, her, her eternity is washing the blood of the world away. Of humanity. Hello. Yeah. And she even said, I think there was a line where she's like, there's so much blood now. And I was like, oh. And then who was it? Who said it? Oh, the that woman at the end from the Lost and Found place. She's like, there are more humans than ever dying these days. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yikes. Well. Well, good thing we have the dead boys to yes. help everybody go to where they belong. Absolutely. To move on. <laughs> so what do you give it? What would you rate it? I, you know, a solid four out of five. Mm. A solid four out of five. Yeah. I was playing with five, but I'm going to give it a four and a half. Yeah. I feel, I think because I'm so hesitant to be like, Five is like if they don't renew it for a second season, I'm gonna be really mad. Heartbroken. Yeah, but we're getting a season two, Sam. Man, so if that does well, the Sandiverse can get bigger. This uh, is my thing. If Sandman is too intense for you, which it is for me, then Dead Boy Detectives is perfect. That's for you. the thing that I'm so excited for for this like universe because there could be so many different types of stories. Mm. Sandman is very like thematic and like really thought provoking and like it could be boring for some people. I get it. This is going to capture a whole other audience. So I'm excited to see what you guys think. What other people think. Yes. Let us know. Book the dead boy detectives. Yeah. You're going to love them. You're going to love them. You're going to love them. <laughs> <laughs> and then let us know who your favorite side character was yeah. or favorite case. Uh, Cause that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I really want to know. So many people are so funny. Ugh. Anyway. Okay. So next week. Next week, X-Men. Back to X-Men 97. Yeah. You know, we're still dealing with the death of Gambit. It's fine. We might. <laughs> we also might have a uh, time traveler and a blue box stuff going on the podcast. Mm -hmm. You heard it here first. We got to the end of the episode. So maybe some exclusive stuff. We'll see. I don't know. Some exciting things that yes. uh, Disney's giving us the opportunity to do. So goodbye. Very lucky. <laughs> <Woo -hoo>. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>